Hello, my name is Tatiana Watkins, and I'll be presenting on the 2021 Passport and Time Project that happened on the Nasser National Forest in direct association with the Oregon Chinese Diaspora Project. I want to take a quick moment and apologize. I live in a basement apartment, so my internet is not as good as it should be. <laughs> All right, just to give a little bit of historical background, as Don said in his presentation, gold was discovered in Grant County in 1862. After uh, after a few years, it expanded outward along the John Day River and within the confines of the now Malheur National Forest. The site in particular for the Passport and Time Project was along the tributary of the Middle Fork of the John Day River. And the first mining claim that we can find of this area is in May of 1869 by the Ah Yi and Co, a Chinese-owned mining company, who released that land for $300. This included an already established sluice boxes, a ditch, and a cabin that were most likely used by the landowner. In September of 1870, they sold their claim to the James Taylor Mining Company for $42.50. And through primary documents such as mining claims, deed books, newspaper articles, we can see that this site has been consistently mined since. The Oregon Chinese Diaspora Project, I'll be referring to it as the OCDP from now on, was founded in 2016 through a partnership with the Malheur National Forest and SULA. This project has since expanded its partnerships to various agencies and heritage sites, historical societies and museums. The OCDP's goal focuses on research, collaboration and education regarding the members of Chinese diaspora in Oregon's history. The Malheur National Forest has been hosting OCDP, OCDP projects and events since 2017 with field schools with SUA, public lectures, outdoor events, yearly presentations at conferences such as the Northwest Anthropological Conference and here, the SHAs. The data recovered through the OCDP has been utilized in several graduate theses, including this project, which is part of my graduate research. Passport in Time, I'll refer to it as PIT, is a forest service run program, though they now have expanded to other partners such as the Bureau of Land Management. And it enlists the helps of volunteers from around the country in preserving cultural resources, whether that is data management, archival work, excavation, or interpretation. Though past PIT projects have been conducted in association with Chinese diaspora on the Malheur, there have been two specific PIT projects in direct association with the Oregon Chinese Diaspora Project. The first was held in July of 2019 in conjunction with the Sula Archaeological Field School, and the latest was held from June 28th to July 2nd of 2021. This project explored potential dwelling sites occupied by gold miners in the late 19th century. If those date ranges surprise you, it should because that was also the hottest week of the summer. And as you can see on these photos, there was not a lot of shade, so we had to have Many canopies, many water breaks, but we got a lot done in just that five session, five day session. During this project, we were not anticipating as many applications as we did get. We got 63 applications for this project. And by we, I mean myself, Don Han, who's a forest archaeologist and was the lead, as well as Katie Whitby, who was the principal investigator and the district archaeologist. We selected 16 volunteers out of those 63 applications. These volunteers, in collaboration with Forest Service employees, excavated these two dwellings. Um, during the five-day sessions, volunteers completed pedestrian survey, metal detector-assisted survey, recorded and collected surface artifacts, and excavated multiple areas in each site. These 16 volunteers donated over 480 hours during this session. We're really grateful for them. We also had three crew leads who were Forest Service interns, and they each contributed over 60 hours as well. These two areas were labeled IE1 and IE2 during the project, though they were initially recorded as feature 13 and feature 14 in the archaeological site record. It was a lot easier for consistency and paperwork sake just to label them IE1 and IE2 because we believe they were associated with the IE mining company. There is a large Placer mining wash pit that's pretty extensive, which spans over 50 meters that connect these two areas as well. Prior to the start of the pit project, we did want to clear it out. We have a we had a lovely pine thicket developing in one of our sites. So a couple of days were spent clearing the sites and running one meter wide transect lines throughout each of the features. 
each of the concentrations. And so we began the pit project with pedestrian survey, going through the lanes, marking any surface artifacts with specific colored plastic chips. And then we had metal detectors going through each lane at least twice. And those plastic discs helped avoid any interference for the metal detectors. And then everything was mapped by hand. As you can see, the bottom right and the bottom left hand photos just show how many pits we were seeing, how many surface artifacts we were finding. So it didn't necessarily make a whole bunch of sense to GPS every single, every single one because they're so close together. So we did it all by hand and then we GPS concentrations. And then they were replaced with pink flags. Following the surface artifact collection, four areas were chosen to be excavated based on the hits and overall patterns at IE1. It is a smaller site at, compared to IE2, and we chose two QTUs, quarter test units, 50 by 50 centimeters within these concentrations and two on the outskirts of them. We noted instantly that there was very little subsurface artifacts. And so we primarily focused on a horizontal exposure of the site, looking a little, branching out a little bit and just mainly focusing on the surface. We also use a pinpointer, a pinpointer, which is a mini metal detector wand. And we did 10 different metal detecting probes, all of which were nails. Um, and then at IE2, we noted that there was maybe eight surface artifacts in total, and most of it was subsurface, around 20 centimeters. Uh, so we did more QTUs, we did eight in total, and also 10 of those metal detector probes. Okay, artifacts. There were not as many artifacts as IU, in IE1 as there was IE2. There were 390 total that we had collected. We did not collect every single one, but we did record them, so they are in our documentation. Most of them are designated under indefinite use or structural indefinite use because they're so fragmented, we're still having an issue piecing together what exactly they were, and structural. And by that, I mean modified cans. <laughs> These cans were carefully disassembled. They were flattened and nailed, most likely onto a structure for either reinforcement or protection from the elements. Note the dry food can in the center that has a purposeful square cut. We're thinking a potential patchwork job was needed. The bottom left corner also shows some Chinese brown glaze stoneware that was found. We were fortunate enough that there were bases, which we're really excited to find all the time. Uh, the lack of glaze, glaze on the base and the sure diameter analysis demonstrates that these most likely came from a wide mouth or spouted jar. A substantial amount of glass was found at the site as well. However, they are incredibly fragmented and more work is being done on identifying the types. I do want to give a special shout out to the AACC right now. We've been using their references and their expertise in identifying some of our artifacts with their amazing comparative collection. So thank you, Dr. Priscilla Wagers and Renee Campbell. All you two had vastly different material culture types as opposed to all you one, where there was mainly foundational material and broken glass. It really was telling the story of a temporary camp, whereas all you two has double the amount of artifacts and indicating a longer occupation time. So artifacts include white earthenware ceramics. This maker's mark dates back to the late 1850s. However, we do know that these types of ceramics were, very, were used for a while. Multiple eating utensils, bone fragments. The photo in the top left-hand corner shows a swine humerus being exposed in the unit. This was one of our QTUs where we did find this bone protruding out of the wall, so we did extend it into a one-by-one. -one. The photo next to it also shows a tobacco tag with the word bangle. The only information found to date this tag was through newspaper advertisements, and this specific brand was only advertised from 1885 to, to 1893, excuse me. And maker's marks on two bottles, one of bitters and one of beer bottle, gave us another date range of 1860 to 1884. This site also had work-related artifacts, including a pick handle connector, heavily used axe head, and a broken pick piece. Another, uh, the only similarity we see between these two sites is the presence of modified and repurposed artifacts. However, their uses are vastly different. In IE1, we saw cans that were used in a primarily structural capacity, and here we see a potentially variety of uses. The bottom left shows a bundle of wire that is actually multiple different gauges that are twisted together to be reused at a later time. 
The artifact next to it is a piece of sheet metal or a can that has been flattened and there are potential roofing nails. Uh, researchers have suggested to us that those were used on roofs as a type of gutter to help the waterways off. The top right corner, if anyone has good guess, I'd love to hear about it in the chat. Um, it is a meat can. It was emptied and then the holes were placed into it. It's very thin and very short, so it doesn't seem like a very suitable strainer, especially if you have larger cans around, which there were. So one potential option that we see is this was maybe used as a grater. The bottom right is a small can lid with only half of it with the nails punched in. So our working hypothesis was that it was removed, the holes were placed, and they put it back on and used it as a type of shaker for the can. A more detailed analysis is being conducted and will be presented at this year's Northwest Anthropological Conference. The 2021 Passport and Time Project enabled volunteers to become active members in the Oregon Chinese Diaspora Project. Through archival and archaeological work, we know that as opposed to the common trope of Chinese miners coming in after extensive mining to rework tailings and then leave, we see here that Chinese miners were one of the earlier companies that worked in this area and also sold their claim to a Euro-American company. The OCDP and the excavations hosted by the Napier have led to many interesting finds as dem demonstrated in this speech and at later presentations. Grants have been applied through the University of Idaho to fund graduate research on the Napier, including laboratory work, which recently happened in the past semester. I was able to employ two undergraduates who worked above minimum wage to help clean artifacts, and it was really appreciative, and they also did additional research on them. Public outreach is an important element in the OCDP's program and goal to develop a better understanding of Oregon's history. Volunteering through a Passport and Time project is one of the ways to share these narratives and engage with the community in a meaningful way. And for some acknowledgments and references, all the individuals of the PIP project, I highly appreciate you all, um, including Katie Whitby, who is a principal investigator, Don, who was one of the leads, our crew leads, our lab technicians, and to all of our amazing volunteers. And more information about this Passport and Time project can be found through that link above, or you can also just do Passport and Time to find some additional projects. Thank you.